As the day of Christmas rapidly approaches, we all tend to wait until the last minute to do our holiday shopping. Sometimes it's a result of just waiting for the proper funds to come in, but more times than not, it's because we just wait entirely too long. That's what I did last year around this time, and it taught me a lesson I'll never forget. It was about a week away until Christmas, and I had yet to buy anything for my boyfriend. He had an extremely stressful year, and I had every intention of spoiling him this year, but the time just slipped away. More than anything in the world, he wanted a PlayStation 5, and he jokingly said that's what he wanted. He didn't expect me to get that for him due to the steep price tag at the time and the near impossible availability of the merchandise, but like I said, this year I really wanted to do something special for him. So, I have to say, I'm not a gamer and I don't know anything about that world other than whatever I see him playing, so I didn't really understand just how hard it would be to get my hands on a PlayStation 5. That week I went to every single store and called every store within 50 miles and nobody had a PS5. And that's what I get for waiting until the last second. I was determined to get my hands on the PlayStation no matter what though, so... So I did what everyone does, and looked online for anybody selling a PS5, and I found dozens of hits, and then almost threw up at how much people were asking for a video game system. I was in utter shock that people spent that much on video games, but like I said, I know nothing about that world. I remember going to work that night and asking some of my coworkers who play video games if that was normal, and they confirmed that if I desperately wanted a PS5, that I was going to have to spend way more money than the asking price. That night I narrowed down my search to the three cheapest prices. Two of the ads were well over an hour from my house and the most expensive of the three were only about 20 minutes away. I decided to text the number and see if the machine was still available and if it was, I was going to get it for him. The guy's name was Alan and he wanted all inquiries to text him to the number he provided, which I did. We chatted for a bit and he seemed like a pretty alright guy other than the fact that he was hoarding and selling PlayStations at a jacked up price. We agreed on a time to meet up at 9pm that Monday. I was not crazy about that time, but he said he could only do nights because of his job. He seemed a little sketchy, like anything on the internet, but I needed that PlayStation, so I was going to make this happen no matter what. Monday night comes and I certainly wasn't going to meet this Allen fellow by myself. I called my friend Rita, who agreed to come with me. Rita is a tough chick who I wouldn't mess with. In fact, I don't know very many human beings who would mess with Rita. Not only is Rita beautiful, but she's built like a goddess. She does professional weightlifting, and she's way over six feet tall. So just on the off chance that this deal ended up being something horrible, Rita would be there to regulate. The drive out to Alan's address was terrible. Of course, the snow started to come down hard when we were going to an area in the dark that we're unfamiliar with. A little over 20 minutes later, we pulled up to the address provided by Alan. The house was a beat-up looking shack. If not for the big red pickup truck outside, I would say that this place is certainly abandoned. I texted Alan that I was outside and questioned if this was the correct address. He said it was, and to just come right in. Rita said if I go inside, that she'd have to beat me up just for being that dumb. So I asked if he could come outside, and he responded that he had broken his leg and he was not able to move, hence why all the lights were off. I looked at Rita and said, I have to at least check this out. He could be telling the truth. Rita looked at me like I was insane, and I think I was a little nuts. Rita said, Girl, this is clearly a setup. Get your man something else. It's not worth getting robbed or worse. I thought for a second, then looked at Rita and smiled, and I said, Well, that's why you're here, love, so I don't get robbed or worse. Ugh, just writing this. I feel sick about how horrible of a friend I am. I literally put myself and my best friend in danger for my own selfish needs. Anyway, Rita sighed and agreed to come to the door with me, but she insisted on leading the way. Right before we were about to get out of the car, Alan texted me again and said, Are you coming or what? As we got out of the car and started to approach the beat-up house, I was typing and sending a message just saying that we were walking to the door now. Well good thing I sent that text, because right after I pushed send, we were walking by the red truck and I heard a buzz as we passed. Rita and I both looked at each other because that sounded like a phone vibrating right as Alan would have received my message. 
So the question to us was, why would he be in that truck? I received another message from Alan, and this time the message said, I thought you were coming alone. I read the message out loud for Rita, who basically at this point was about to carry me back to the car. That message was my breaking point, and I didn't like any of this, so I decided to just get in the car and leave. At that exact moment, the red truck turned on and peeled out of the driveway, nearly hitting Rita who drove out of the way. Rita was laying on the ground holding her arm in pain and the red truck turned around now heading back toward me in the driveway. I ran over to Rita to try to help her. She was slow to get to her feet and when the driver of the truck was only a few feet away, he stopped and got out of the truck. It was a short man, but he looked like he was very muscularly built. He ran at me, grabbing my arm and tugged me toward the truck. I tried to fight him off, but he was incredibly strong for being that small. But thank God for Rita though. This one of a kind woman got up, ran at the guy, and shoulder checked him. He let go of me, got back in the truck, and just peeled off once again. We helped each other up, got in our car, and sped off in the opposite direction of his truck. We took every zigzag that we could to find our way home. As we got back to Rita's house, we called the police and made an official statement. I gave the cop all the information I could, but of course, like all these scam artists, none of this information given by Alan was real. Neither Rita nor I got a good look at the license plate, and honestly, through the darkness, the snow, and all the chaos, I couldn't even tell you for sure which brand of truck it even was. I thought it was a Chevy, and Rita thought it was a Ford. All I know for sure is that Alan had a red pickup truck. The number was a burner phone or whatever those things are called and his profile was of course fake and deleted. The cops did everything they could and they tried to be more helpful but unfortunately we just didn't have very much information to go on. I owe everything I have to Rita for saving me that night. I told my boyfriend this story after Christmas and he nearly lost his mind. Rita ended up breaking her arm when she dove out of the way and that made the injury even worse when she shoulder checked the guy. I felt so horrible. I even offered to help Rita pay her hospital bill, but she refused to let me. I will never wait until the last minute to do my holiday shopping ever again, and if I can't find what I'm looking for at the store or online, then I'll find something else. Many people like myself dread the idea of shopping around the holidays. Up until just a few years ago I loved it, but an unfortunate event made me change my mind instantly. I used to like to think of myself as a professional shopper, in the sense that I've always been up to date with the latest sales, where to get them, and when is the best time to strike. Shopping at one time in my life was more than an obligation, and in fact was a hobby. Well, several years ago, my friend Carissa and I were planning our route. Like I said, I knew the best deals and when to strike, so I mapped out the best course for us to maximize our holiday shopping. The first mistake I made was shopping on a Saturday. The store we went to was filled to the brim with people. It looked like chaos inside the giant department store, with people literally running around. Carissa doesn't do well with rowdy crowds like this, so she was anxious as can be. I like to move fast in these situations, but because of her anxiety, I was moving a lot slower than I like to. The one thing I needed to get more than anything else here at this store was a video game for my brother, and I knew that this said game was going to be a hot commodity. I could have gone to a dozen other stores, but this store was selling the game for $15 cheaper than everywhere else. Once Carissa finally started to calm down a bit, I made a dash for the electronics department and to my surprise and joy, the game was still on the shelf. As I grabbed the game, another woman came over and tried to grab the game out of my hands. I pulled away with some force and yelled, Hey, watch what you're doing. I turned and started to walk away, and the woman started to shout at me. That was my game. You took it from me. I just waved her off and kept walking as I shook my head in disbelief. I clearly grabbed the game first. Once I got back to my cart, I started to speak with Carissa, when out of nowhere, the same crazy woman pushed me over my cart. She pushed me with my back turned, and I fell into the ground. 
I got to my feet and tried to process what was happening, and before I could even remotely contemplate what was happening, this woman grabbed my hair and started to pull it. I kicked her off of me and proceeded to lash out on her with a verbal lashing of some choice words that I won't put on here, but let this be a lesson to all. Violence of any kind does not pay off because security not only escorted this deranged woman out of the store, but I also got kicked out of the store as well. They didn't care about my side or her side of the story. They didn't want to deal with any trouble, so basically, we just got thrown out with the threat of legal action if we remained on the property. So, after all of that, neither of us got the game, or any of the other items I had in my cart already. I cooled off after a while, and Carissa and I got all of our shopping done elsewhere. I even found the game I was looking for. It was a little more money, but I still got it nonetheless. I wish I could say that this is where my story ends, though. But of course, this nightmare was only just the start for me. When we finished shopping, we decided to go get a drink at one of the bars located right in the same plazas as the other stores we went shopping at. We both just ordered a cheap beer and were planning on only having one drink. One drink turned into two drinks, of course, because we had a lot to talk about. As we got ready to cash out, a man came and stood right behind our stools. I could tell Carissa was visibly uncomfortable. It's a bar and sometimes people are oblivious to their surroundings, so I didn't care too much. But to make her feel better, I said something to the man. Hey, I'm sorry, we're, we're getting ready to leave in a minute. Do you think you could maybe back up a little so we can get out? The man said nothing and just stared at me. Uh, can I help you, dude? The man took a step closer and still said nothing. He was inches from the stool now. So close that I wouldn't be able to move the stool out even if I wanted to. This was probably the longest, most awkward 20 seconds of my life with no talking and finally the man said in a slow and raspy voice, What's wrong with you? I was amazed at that question. I'm sure I made a face of disgust, which probably made him angrier, but at that moment, I had no idea who this guy was or what he wanted. Before I could ever say anything, the man spoke up again and said, That was my game. You took it, and now I don't have it. I started to laugh. In my head, I figured I was playing with fire, but I was so annoyed at this point that I didn't care. <laughs> Look, dude, I got kicked out of the store too. Your girlfriend, or whatever she is, attacked me. She's lucky I don't press charges. Back up and let us leave. The man slowly backed away, and we grabbed our stuff and left. We walked away from the bar and made our way to the door, and I turned around just to make sure this guy wasn't following us. He was an ugly man. He was probably only in his early 30s, but looked horrible. He smelled like old, dirty socks and had these nasty, buck-yellow teeth. When I turned around, he was still standing by that bar stool. As we got outside, I heard Carissa gasp, and she clenched her mouth. What is it? I said nervously. Carissa didn't even need to respond. I saw why she gasped right away. The woman from the store was standing next to my car. She was holding a bat or some type of blunt object in her hand. I wasn't about to say anything this time because it seemed like my mouth kept getting me in trouble. I tried to go back inside the bar and the man was standing right on the other side of the glass door. I tried to remain as calm as possible, especially since Carissa was completely unglued at this point. My logic was telling me that we were only in minor danger. It was still only around 8pm currently and there were a ton of people and witnesses all around. I grabbed Carissa's arm and said in a calm voice, Just breathe and try to relax. I'm going to grab my phone and call the police. I slowly reached for my phone, and the woman started to dash at me again just as she did inside the store. I like to call it a holiday miracle, but the impossible happened next. A group of six people came outside the bar, stepped in front of us, and basically shielded us. I assumed that they were three couples, as they must have witnessed everything that went down in the bar and outside. The one bigger guy from the group looked at the woman and said, You don't want to do this. Just walk away. The woman paused in her tracks. She looked like she was going to charge at us again, but she lowered her head and just ran away. Seconds after that, the man from inside the bar charged through the door and ran in the same direction as the woman. My thought was correct. The bigger guy who confronted the woman 
His girlfriend was the one who quite honestly saved our life. She was outside the bar smoking a cigarette and she heard the guy and the woman talking about luring the two girls out and then taking care of business, whatever that means. The woman from the bar thought it sounded suspicious, obviously, so she told her boyfriend about the conversation. Not five minutes after that, she said is when she saw the little man standing right behind us at the bar stools. At that moment, the girl, her boyfriend, and the entire party watched the entire situation unfold, and I'm so thankful that they did. There really are some good people out there. I understand that there is so much more I could have done in that situation. I didn't handle it correctly at all, and I guess that may just be a result of me being in my early 20s at the time, and honestly, I just didn't really want to extend this horrible interaction any longer. I did contact the location manager of the entire plaza to let them know about these two creeps, but they really didn't seem to care too much. At least it didn't seem like they cared. They said something along the lines of they get hundreds of complaints every day or something like that. I have yet to visit that plaza since that horrible December night. The only positive that came from that night is that I now have a wild story I can share with new friends this time of year. And I gained six new Facebook friends that I'm still in contact with today. I may be a negative person, but I hate the holidays. I hate the cold, I hate the snow, but more than anything, I hate the hustle and bustle of the holiday season, especially the holiday shopping season. Maybe I'm just jaded from working in retail my entire adult life, but people are a special kind of rude during Christmas. Also, it's possible that I am just extra jaded right now because this story is very fresh and actually just happened a few days ago. So, full disclosure, I apologize in advance if anybody reading this loves Christmas or the holiday season. I don't mean to offend you, but if I didn't hate it before, I certainly do now. The last several years, I've done about 95% of my holiday shopping online, and that had been the greatest gift that anybody could ever ask for. Shopping for all my loved ones from the comfort of my living room is something that I cherish, probably more than the actual holiday. However, this year, my friend Laura moved back up north from Georgia and wanted to go to the mall. My hometown has a very large mall that is packed to the brim this time of year. I love Laura to death, but I don't agree on certain things. She loves people in crowds, and in case you haven't picked up on it yet, I hate crowds and people and really everything of that sort. Back in high school, everyone used to call me the Grinch, a nickname that I sort of embraced. Sidebar, what's funny about that nickname is that my name is Cindy, so instead of calling me Cindy Lou Who, who is a character from The Grinch, for anyone that doesn't know, they call me The Grinch. Just a funny coincidence, I think. Laura begged me to go shopping with her at the mall, and even though I knew I was going to hate it, I agreed to go with her because she was my best friend. And just as I thought, the mall was a circus. There were thousands of people rushing around doing holiday stuff. Laura was in her glory. Laura isn't an idiot though, and she knew how much I hated all of this, so she promised to buy me lunch after we finished our shopping, a sweet deal for me. After a few hours of just absolute torture, we went to one of the many restaurants in the mall. This was by far the best part of the trip, until we noticed one of the men working there. I assumed that he was a busboy or a dishwasher or something. He worked there for sure, but he wasn't a server. I kept asking Laura to make sure that I wasn't crazy and look to see if this guy was staring directly at me. And I don't mean like looking at me, I mean like staring, intensely staring. At first she laughed it off, but once an hour or so went by and he was still staring at me, I was not pleased. I asked our server who the guy was and if he was weird or anything like that. She laughed and said, Oh, that's Dax. He's a sweet guy. Uh, he just divorced his wife a few months ago, so he's probably trying to tell you he's interested or something. <laughs> Laura and the server laughed, but I didn't find it funny. It's one thing to steal a glance and check someone out, but this was different somehow. He was staring at me like he was in shock that I was there, like how a small child stares upon Santa for the first time. We paid our tab and moved on with our lives. I was done with the mall, and I was most assuredly done with Dax or whoever he was. That night, Laura was going to stay over at my house for old time's sake. 
We planned on drinking wine, wrapping presents in front of my fireplace, and watching some Christmas movies. At some point during the night, we noticed a car outside my living room window. We looked, and the bright halogen lights were on, but we couldn't see the driver. I have parking on my street, so this wasn't too strange. It was just kind of annoying because the lights were pretty much shining right inside my house. The car remained there for a while, though, but finally turned the lights off. We looked at the car again, and there was no driver. So whoever was the driver parked the car for the evening and finally went to wherever their destination was. After the lights ordeal, we decided to watch Jim Carrey's The Grinch. We both passed out about halfway through the movie. I woke up a few hours later to Laura whispering my name and shaking me. It was around 1.30am and Laura said that she thought she heard something in the kitchen a little while ago. I don't like being woken up so I said some dismissive comment and told her to go back to bed. I closed my eyes but I could feel Laura still standing over me. Annoyed, I said, What, Laura? There's literally nobody else here. It was probably the ice maker. She looked terrified and said, Cindy, there were footsteps. I heard someone in the kitchen, and I'm pretty sure the footsteps went upstairs. She piqued my interest, but I was confident that in the neighborhood that I lived, I did not have an intruder. Still annoyed, I rolled up off the couch, sighed, and said, Okay, well, let's have a look, shall we? She didn't want to, but she didn't want to be alone either. So, she followed me, even though she was clearly shaking in fear. In the kitchen, there appeared to be no signs of evidence of any types of break-ins or forced entry. I started to walk up the staircase, and Laura begged me not to. I told her that I needed to so we could go back to bed in peace. Next to the back door was my old softball stuff from fall. I grabbed my bat and told her that we would be safe because I have a bat, a decision that proved to be the best one I ever made. We got upstairs and stood in the narrow hallway. I turned on the light and said, Look, Laura, no monsters or intru- I stopped immediately in mid-sentence because I noticed two very alarming things. Number one, my closet in the hallway was ajar, something that I never let happen due to my OCD. I always make sure my doors are shut all the way. And number two, there was mud coming from my bedroom doorway leading to the closet. Laura, who was still standing on the landing that leads upstairs, whispered, What is it, Cindy? I turned and looked back at her and mouthed the words, Call 911 now. While I was turned around looking at Laura, the closet door busted open, and someone ran full speed at me and Laura. With zero hesitation, I turned and smashed the intruder in the face with my bat, and they fell to the ground instantly, and began writhing in pain. I was now screaming to Laura to call 911 as I stood in a baseball stance ready to swing for the fences again, and that's when I noticed who the intruder was. The guy, the creep from lunch, Dax. I wanted to hit him again, but I refrained from the urge. I was somehow in the moment cognizant of my actions. I didn't know if I could get in trouble if I actually seriously hurt this guy. Within minutes, the police showed up and apprehended that guy, Dax, immediately. And when they were bringing Dax out of my house, he just kept whining and saying, I love you, Cindy. How could you do this to me? After some back and forth with the police, and obviously I'm going to press charges, we found out that Dax had graduated with me and Laura. I had zero memory of this dude, but my graduating class had like 1,200 kids or something, and I knew like 50 of them. Because this just happened, nothing of note has occurred yet. He was arrested and he's still being held at the jail. I have another meeting with my lawyer tomorrow to go over some things. I just really wanted to share this story with anybody that would listen. The image of Dax, clearly not his real name for legal reasons, bursting out of my closet is an image that has burned into my brain. I can't even go upstairs without shaking and being reminded of the night. I may have handled it like a champ, sure, but... Mentally, I'm scarred. If I didn't hate the holidays a ton before, I absolutely despise them now.
So many people that I know personally really hate the Christmas shopping season. To them, it's more like a nuisance to shop for loved ones, as if they're only doing it out of some sort of requirement. Me, on the other hand, I love this time of year so much. So much, in fact, that I went and got a job at Kohl's part-time just to assist with all the holiday shopping, and I love retail and customer service, which I realize makes me sound actually insane, but I do love it. I only work maybe 10 hours a week just as a cashier. They really liked me there and constantly offered me more hours, but I didn't want to sacrifice my main job for slightly more than minimum wage. Like I said, this was just a part-time job because I love helping people during the holiday season. I was always so cheerful and bubbly to the customers. I tried to have my temperament come off as infectious as I tried to spread holiday cheer to every customer who came through my line. During my time as a cashier, I had every type of customer you can imagine. Great ones, bad ones, and everything in between. But one customer specifically I have to put in his own category. He wasn't just bad, he was terrifying and traumatizing. My evening started like every other evening I worked. It was around 5pm and only a week until Christmas, so the people were getting crazy. Toward the end of my shift, the peculiar looking man came through my line. He was tall, like really tall. Now I'm only 5 foot 3 and this guy seemed to be way over a foot taller than me. He had a long brown beard that went down to his chest. His hair was very long and wild and went in every direction possible, but he was still rocking a bald patch right in the top center of his head. He was an average built guy and if I had to guess I would say in his late 40s. His clothes were more shocking than his appearance and he had a lime green coat that was zipped up to the top. Across the back of the coat was the phrase, Santa's helper. He was wearing aviator style glasses, but they had no lenses in them, it was just the frames. He had two front teeth, and that seemed like all of his teeth, at least that I could see. I don't know what you would call his pants. They were like pants that you'd see in an old American movie or play, like something George Washington would wear. And he had the high stocking to go with the pants. I know they have a name, but I can't remember what they're called. Sorry, I know that was a long and overly descriptive explanation, but I really want you to be able to visualize this weirdo. When he finally got ready to cash out, he was literally buying one throw pillow that you'd put on a love seat or a small sofa. It was a pillow with Santa's face on it. A creepy Santa, not a cute cartoony one. I greeted the man and went through my entire cold speech at the register. When I was done speaking, the man just stared at me with his blank and almost expressionless eyes. After a moment of awkwardness, he finally said, You're perfect. You know that. Not the weirdest thing anybody has ever said to me, but coming from him, it was a bit alarming. I just smiled and said thank you. I cashed him out quickly and gave him his receipt and said in my chipper voice, Have a nice day. And I smiled at the man. He didn't walk away for a few seconds and continued to stare at me. I finally just turned to the next customer who forcibly threw all their stuff on the counter for me to cash out. All while this happened, the man barely broke his concentration on me and slowly started to walk away as he kept me in his sights the entire time. I finally decided to just ignore him and go on with my shift. Before long it was so busy that I had forgotten about this strange man. He wasn't in the store anymore and I have to say I did feel a strange sense of relief. I figured the guy was just a little strange and I didn't want to hold it against him. That night when I left, I had one of my coworkers walk me to my car just because I felt it in my bones that this guy was some type of loose cannon. Again, I felt relief when I got to my car and saw that I had no giant man waiting for me. But that night when I got home, I told my husband all about the man and how creepy and weird the interaction was. My husband laughed because he thought it was just funny. And in that moment, I kind of chuckled too. Before bed that night, as my husband and I were getting ready, we heard a knock on the door. We both looked at each other in confusion and with a bit of fear. Who the heck is the person at the door, we thought. My husband shouted, Who is it? Instead of a verbal response, the person at the door responded with another knock. Then followed that knock with three more knocks, all about a second apart. We approached the door together and looked out of the living room window where we could see who was at the door. I kid you not, it was the man from my line earlier. My husband looked at me and said, 
Is that the guy you were telling me about? How does he know where you live? I couldn't even speak. I just stood there frozen. My husband approached the door and yelled from our side. Hey, listen. If you leave now, I won't call the police. I was watching the man through the living room window during this interaction. After my husband said that, the man took his hand off the door and just stood in front of the door. I mean, legitimately just standing in front of the door. It looked like his nose was touching the door from my vantage point. When the man didn't respond, my husband said, All right then, police it is. After he said that, the man started to bang on the door harder and harder. My husband stood there holding the door as he called the police, and even though I don't think this man could have broken through the locks, finally I yelled, What do you want? And the man stopped knocking again. He turned to look at me through the living room window. Did you mean that? What you said earlier? I looked at the man and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. The man walked toward the window, now standing right in front of it. You told me to have a nice day. Did you mean it? I didn't answer him. I probably should have because now he started to bang on the window and he yelled, Did you mean it? I just started to scream. My husband stood in front of me and basically stood on the other side of the window waiting for the police to show up. The man grabbed a rock from the front of the house. He threw it, using it to break the window. As the glass shattered, my husband ran at the man and kicked him as he tried to climb through the window. He fell back and as he got back up to approach the window, the cops were pulling up to the house. Two police officers ran up to the man as he still tried to climb inside, even though the cops grabbed him and pulled him back. As the cops were trying to apprehend the man, he said again in a loud voice, Did you mean it? The cops pulled him away and put him in the back of the squad car. My husband talked to the cops and I just sat there trying to process the insanity of the events that just happened. Clearly, the man was arrested and charged and as far as I know, he's still in custody as of currently. The scariest part of this entire story is the next morning when we went outside to assess all the damage. The Santa pillow was right outside the window and it had a note on it attached to the back of the pillow that said, have a nice day. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. The holiday season is a wonderful time of year for friends and family, if you have that. Unfortunately for me, I don't see eye to eye with my family, so I moved about 18 hours away from my hometown. As for friends, well, at the time of this story, I didn't have any to speak of, until I met Chet. He was an alright guy, your average everyday man. The reason why I say he was instead of he is, is because Chet and I don't talk anymore. Sometimes people in your life can be just toxic, and that was Chet for me. He was always getting me into weird and strange situations. Just for a little bit of backstory, I met Chet at my job. Nothing special, we both work at a local Target. Our friendship started out on a bit of an awkward note as Chet asked me out on a date. Unfortunately for Chet, I wasn't looking to date, and I also don't like men. Chet took the news well, and we honestly still hit it off as friends. The good parts of Chet were great. We watched basketball, played Xbox, and talked about movies all the time. It was nice to have a friend. As I mentioned earlier, he was always getting me into weird situations. For example, he constantly set me up on these blind dates that I didn't ask for, and they always went horrible. I tried to not be too hard on Chet because I figured that he was just trying to help. Then the weird situations got much worse. We go out drinking downtown, which was a decent sized city, nothing huge but big enough, especially for me since I came from an extremely small town. Now, while out drinking, Chet would take me to these strange dive bars and then just leave me there. I can hold my own, but things always seemed to go off the deep end when Chet would leave, mostly because the crowds at these places weren't huge fans of someone like me. Blue hair isn't something the crowds at these places really cared for, so now you're probably asking yourself. Why the heck do I keep hanging out with Chet if he keeps putting me in these horrible situations where I have to find my way home? The simple answer is, 
I'm an idiot. I was lonely, I was young, and I liked Chet's company most of the time. After one very bad accident when I got jumped trying to walk home, which is its own horrifying story for another day, I confronted Chet. I told him that the friendship was over. As much as I valued him, I couldn't put myself into those situations anymore. He was upset and apologized repeatedly. I accepted the apology and we both moved on with our lives. We stayed friends on Facebook and Xbox and all that, but that was it. No more hanging out or texting. No more invites to strange dive bars or blind dates. About a week after this conversation, Chet got fired or quit. I wasn't sure what happened, and that event really bummed me out. As the holiday season approached fast, I realized just how alone I really was, and it made me sad. I had been in my new town for about eight months, and I still had nobody to share the holidays with. That weakness was the catalyst that caused me to text Chet, a decision that deep down I knew I would regret. Chet texted me back right away and was thrilled to hear from me. To be honest with you, I was thrilled to hear from him. I wasn't ready to go out drinking or anything like that, I just wanted some company, so I asked him to go out shopping with me. I figured since I didn't have anybody to shop for, I was going to do some holiday shopping for myself. Chet seemed pumped and we met up that Saturday and started our shopping. We picked up right where we left our friendship, the good parts that is. It was as if no time had passed since we last hung out. We went to a bunch of stores and I bought myself a lot of awesome stuff. Before calling it a night, Chet asked if we could go to one more store. Not even remotely being concerned about Chet or my well-being, I said of course and asked where we were going. Chet looked at me and smiled and he said in a confident voice, You just wait, you're gonna love this place. I shrugged and said okay, not for one second thinking of all the times this dude left me at random places. Like I said, I'm an idiot. Probably close to 20 minutes or so of driving, I finally asked him where we were going, and he responded, now in a much different tone than before, and said, we're going somewhere great. I already told you, you're going to love it. This was the magic moment where everything clicked for me. Now about 20 minutes too late, I remembered Chet's game, and how he always put me in these horrible situations, but this felt different. Chet felt cold, and now this wholesome situation somehow felt sinister. Call it whatever you want, but I just knew something was wrong. The only person I knew in the area that I could text was my boss, Michelle. We were not close or friends or anything like that, but at least she knew me. I texted her my location and my situation. I told her I was with Chet, who used to work at the store, and that I had a bad feeling in my stomach. I apologized for texting her and told her that I had nobody else to text. First off, hats off to Michelle for texting me back right away, but what Michelle said made me sick. She texted back and said in her message, Send me your exact location right now. You may be in danger. I'm coming to get you. What did that mean? I thought to myself, I kept sending her my updated location as Chet just drove in silence. We finally arrived at a broken down looking barn in the middle of nowhere. Chet got out of the car and told me to get out. I told him I was going to stay put until my ride got there. Well, that development made Chet very angry. He started to kick the dirt and mud around the car and started shouting, Your ride? What ride? I wasn't even doing anything wrong. Yeah, I'm not sure what he thought he was doing, but this was definitely wrong. He started shouting at me from the outside of the car, saying, Just go in the barn. You'll love it. There's a market in there. Come on. I told him it wasn't going to happen and that he needed to step away from the car. He just screamed and cursed for a while, literally was having a temper tantrum. After a few minutes, he abruptly turned and ran into the barn. There was literally no other cars here. I started to think this was my chance to run. He was in there for about a minute or so, and that was when I decided to quietly leave the car and sprint as fast as I could down the main road until hopefully Michelle or somebody passed by. At this point, she must have been anywhere between 5 and 10 minutes away. I'm not sure exactly how long I'd been running, but it felt like a while. Thankfully, I ran cross-country in high school, so I was able to run a great distance, and with the adrenaline of the situation, I felt like the flash. Finally, I saw headlights in the distance. It had to be Michelle, I thought. 
I turned up my speed to meet this vehicle coming at me, and that's when I noticed Chet running full speed behind me. This lunatic was chasing me down, and I had no clue that he was even trailing me at that moment. Thankfully, the vehicle was Michelle. She pulls over, and I got into the backseat quickly, and within seconds, Chet was at the vehicle screaming, Hey! That's my date! Come back! I just kept yelling, drive, 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 over and over again, and, and once we made it back in town, Michelle took me back to her place. By the time we got there, I'd already had about 23 missed calls from Chet. Michelle told me that unfortunately, I should get the law involved. I'm the type of person who doesn't like dealing with cops or anything that requires that kind of work, but she was right. This wasn't just some random altercation. This was a potentially dangerous maniac. She told me that he did in fact get fired. It was for violently threatening a customer. I guess the law was involved then, but there was no evidence at all to press charges. He was only fired because it was like his fifth customer complaint. After everything was said and done, I finally have a restraining order against Chet. Due to all our friendly text messages and nothing of note at the barn that they found, the cops had nothing to really charge him with. I was told I could pursue this further, but I just wanted to move on with my life. I will say, as horrible as this memory was, I did gain a real friend out of this situation in Michelle. I got to spend Christmas with her and her family that year, and I'm planning on attending this Christmas as well. I never heard from Chet again after that night. He's not on Facebook anymore, and I have him blocked on everything else. I have no idea what Chet was planning, and the less I think about it, the better I am. Anybody out there who reads this, please don't be like me. Don't be an idiot. If you know someone is just not right, avoid them. There's always another cure for loneliness. Stay safe and happy holidays. Around the holidays, I like to pick up some extra shift as a security guard at my local mall. I'm a bigger guy and this job allows me to, on rare occasions, to use a little bit of my muscle. From my main job, I sit at a desk all day long from 8 to 5, so this part-time gig is perfect for me. For the most part, I walk around the mall in the afternoon and evening just trying to maintain as much order as you can around the holidays. My imposing stature is usually enough to keep people from getting too wild, but you know how it is this time of year. People get wild and crazy, and for the most part, I rarely have to kick people out or get the actual law involved, so for me, it's just easy money. However, one year my experience was different. It was so horrifying in the moment, and I'm not sure if I can articulate just how scary it was, but I will try to write my story to the best of my ability. With only a few weeks until Christmas, I started my part-time work at the mall. Usually I go in on a Saturday around noon and I work till about 9.30 or 10 p.m. This specific Saturday, though, I got offered by my supervisor to work a much different shift. I was going to be going in at around 6 p.m. and working overnight security. I loved the idea. The second half of my shift consisted of just walking around, doing all my checkpoints, and listening to music or a podcast all night. When I arrived at 6 p.m., the night was much like any other holiday night. It was insanely busy. People were everywhere, teenagers were causing issues, and parents were scrambling to finish their shopping for the year. The mall completely cleared out at around midnight, even the restaurants on the far side of the mall. I did all my checkpoints, and my night of podcasts was just beginning. Every hour or so, I would have to make my rounds and just check a few things. At 3.30am, I was passing a section of the mall, and a door was open that should not have been opened. Most malls or department stores have these secret back rooms that essentially run through the backside of the mall. It's almost like a shortcut to get to different sections of the mall without having to deal with any of the foot traffic. My mall was so big that there was a bank on the inside of this hall where they could cash the checks of the employees who worked at this mall. So needless to say, this door should have been shut and locked. I approached the open door and noticed some boxes knocked over. I'm a rational guy, but I have to be honest. I was scared not because I thought that there may be an intruder, but because of something paranormal. I love listening to horror podcasts, so I was a little jumpy. I took off my headphones so I could listen to the desolate hallway. I could hear a noise that sounded like shuffling but couldn't see anything, and my heart was racing. 
I slowly made my way down the hall. It was about 30 feet to the wall and then a right turn down another massively long hall. I made my way to the wall and when I turned, I just about jumped out of my uniform. There was a person about 10 feet away from me, shuffling very slowly down the hall. It looked like he was almost ice skating on the ground. I shouted to the guy, Hey! Hey you, you can't be here. If you leave now, I won't call the police. The protocol is to call my supervisor or the police right away, but I just wanted to defuse the situation myself. The man didn't respond to my shouting at all and just kept shuffling away from me. Hey! You hear me? Still no response. I slowly approached the person and when I got close, I noticed that he was humming. I couldn't tell the tune that he was humming, but he was definitely humming under his breath. I got right on his side and tried to communicate with the man one last time. Alright buddy, you need to leave right now. No response. And even more horrifying, he was wearing an old school clown mask. Like a plastic clown mask that you'd buy for cheap, not a nice rubber mask. So of course, now all I could think about was a killer clown, so I was extremely on edge. And this was around the time when the clown stories were happening all over the place. <sighs> Alright. I tried to warn you. I'm calling the police. The statement didn't bother the man at all. He just kept humming and shuffling along. I called my supervisor, who called the authorities himself and said that he was on his way in now and to just leave the guy alone in case he might be dangerous. He told me to just keep an eye on him and make sure that I don't lose him. A few minutes later, the cops showed up with my supervisor and we all confronted the shuffling man who at this point was almost to the end of the long hallway, which empties out to the other side of the mall. The cops did their thing, and the man just kept moving. Finally, the cops grabbed him and arrested him, and that is when he finally stopped shuffling his feet. One of the cops removed his mask, and I kid you not, the man was wide-eyed and smiling. He legitimately looked like the Joker. The cops were trying to communicate with the guy, but... He just kept saying in a low and methodical voice, I'm staying overnight. Hooray. I'm staying overnight. Hooray. Over and over with that haunting smile. He just kept repeating it like some type of robot. The cops started to escort the man out of the mall and that's when I noticed the humming tune that he was singing was that phrase that I just heard him utter. I wish I had more of an update on this story for anybody reading this, but unfortunately, I don't know what happened to this shuffling mall clown. I mean, he was technically breaking the law just by being inside the mall and being in a location he wasn't supposed to be, but calling the authorities is as far as I took it. I'm assuming this man was not right in the head, and I hope he got the help he needed. Now every holiday season, when I work my security job, I'm always on the lookout for this strange mall clown. It's been a handful of years now and I haven't seen him yet. Maybe this holiday, I'll hear him shuffling by again. Every year I do my holiday shopping with my buddy Jason. It's just kind of like a holiday tradition for us at this point since we've been doing it since middle school and I'm now 31. The story I'm about to share with you happened last year and my skin still crawls thinking about the nightmare I endured last year. Dealing with crowds and traffic is enough of a nightmare during the holidays but this story is much worse. Last year when Jason and I went shopping he asked if his friend TC could come. Obviously this was cool with me as I didn't care if more people came. We were just shopping after all and I figured any friend of Jason would be a friend of mine. Also, TC seemed like a cool name too, I don't know why. We did our normal route that we usually hit every year. We started with the mall then hit up the classic stores like Target and Walmart. For the most part I get all my holiday shopping done the day Jason and I go every year. The only person I had left to shop for was my little brother who was a big tech kid. I asked if we could make one more stop to this local tech store in the city. It was a rough area outside of town, but this store was known throughout the state. We stopped at the store and I got my brother his gift. I felt good knowing my shopping experience was over for the year. When we got back to the car, TC spoke up and said in an excited voice, 
Yo, about three blocks that way is an abandoned building. I helped shoot an independent film there. You guys had to check it out. Jason was apprehensive, to say the least. We pointed out the fact that it would be trespassing, and we would probably get into a lot of trouble if someone got caught. However, I was totally down to check it out. It was still broad daylight, and this part of the city was basically in ruins at this point. I figured nobody was going to stop us, and if anybody did see us, I really don't think that they would say anything. Jason agreed to check it out, and even though I could tell that he was super uncomfortable with the situation... After the very short drive, we approached the abandoned building. I think I'm just weird, but I love buildings like this. They have such character and history, and now they're just shells. There's an eerie beauty to these abandoned buildings. I imagine to myself that they're like modern-day ancient tombs. The inside of the building was awesome, too. TC was somewhat giving us a tour of what he remembered of the place, but he seemed almost as if he was winging it. There were some scary corridors that were pitch black. We had to use our cell phone flashlights to see. After traversing several flights of stairs and making our way through the maze-like building, I didn't really have an idea of where in the building we were. The building was falling apart, it seemed, as structures seemed to be knocked over all throughout the building. Jason and I continued following TC down some halls, and then we started to approach another dark corridor. We pulled out our phones again, and that's when TC shouted, Check this out. He was a little in front of us, and he stood there pointing to a room off the dark hallway. All three of us shined our lights in this dark room, and it was spooky, I must admit that. There were symbols and all sorts of graffiti on the walls. I stepped into the room to take a closer look. I stood in about the center of the room, waving my hands slowly above my head so I could read all the writing and symbols on the ceiling. Jason and TC stood in the hallway, still shining their lights in the room where I was standing. As I looked at the ceiling, I heard TC say, You guys hear that cracking noise? Well, I heard it a little too late. The floor in the room I was standing in completely collapsed. It hurt bad, but I knew nothing was broken, thankfully. I'm coughing and shouting up to Jason and TC, Guys, guys, I dropped... I dropped my phone when I fell like, can you give me a hand? I'm still dazed when Jason and TC came over and shined their lights down into the pit that I fell into, and all I heard was Jason scream. I looked all around me in the pit where I fell, and there was millions of spiders crawling everywhere. I mean, every inch of this pit was filled with a wave of some type of creepy crawly spiders, it looked like the walls were breathing because of how many spiders were crawling all over the place. With a light shining down, I saw my phone and it was already covered with spiders. They were crawling on my arms, hands, legs, everywhere. I started to freak out and shake myself, and I could feel them falling off my head and hair. I screamed and panicked. I don't like spiders objectively speaking, but this, this was an overkill. I was trapped in this pit and I couldn't get out. Not without their help. The ledge was way too high up to grab. As I was going crazy down in the pit, I heard TC say, No way! No way! I'm out of here! I just kept screaming. I don't know if I was yelling for help or just yelling. And finally, Jason came over to the pit and lowered a big pipe of some kind. I grabbed it and I used the wall to walk myself up out of the hole. Once I got back to the floor, Jason and I both ran until we got to a big open room that was illuminated by the sun outside. We both jumped and shook around, and I kid you not, dozens of spiders were falling out of me. I took about 90% of my clothes off and just ran around the room screaming as I brushed my hands through my hair and beard. I finally caught my breath and started to calm down a little bit. I refused to put my clothes back on, and thankfully Jason gave me his flannel to wear. I even left my shoes behind. I walked out to my car barefoot, and nothing but shorts that were under my sweatpants and Jason's flannel. TC was out by the car when, when we approached. He just started laughing and said, That was crazy, man. You know what's even more crazy? This isn't even the building we shot that film in. It's that building over there. You want to check it out? I stared at him like he was speaking another language to me. I told him to shut up and get in the car. And that night I couldn't stop itching. 
I felt like I had spiders crawling on me for weeks. Even as I write this, I have to keep stopping, just itching myself. And the worst part about this nightmare is that whatever kind of spiders these were, they were biting me. That night when I took a shower, I had little red marks all over my body from where the spiders were biting me. I have yet to talk to TC since the incident, and I don't think Jason has talked to him either. Next time I go holiday shopping, I won't be taking any abandoned building tours. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on YouTube. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon. Or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks and bonus content offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, the McRib is biblically accurate.